farm with kids, dogs, or Atiba Mwanji Davis. Man, that was good. It took me right back there. Hey, now, no, no, don't get in frisky. Go get a room somewhere. <laughs> Happy Martin Luther King Jr. weekend to each and every one of you. I want to contextualize my comments today a little bit with this. I get to share my opinion up here on Sunday morning. And I want to be real clear out of the gate that sometimes it's good for me just to share my opinion. I am not making a statement, a universal uh, uh, statement of what Unity North believes. But I've had the blessed opportunity to come here and share what I believe to be true. I'm going to invite you to take it only as that, my thoughts, that might get a little bit raw today, that might get a little bit sensitive today, but they are my thoughts for you to embrace, for you to reject, for you to think about. You see, the only reason I share my thoughts is to invoke dialogue, to invoke thought that after you leave this space, you're having a conversation at a deeper level, that the idea is being shared between you, people that agree with you, people that disagree with you, is such that the world is a richer and more beautiful environment as a result of what we do here today. Nothing else. Are we good with that today? I'm asking you to suspend your, your view, your thoughts and your processes about Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. You can look at it two different ways. On the surface, it's a nice three-day weekend, isn't it? Ah, I got a day off on Monday. Those are very human eyes. Go ahead and enjoy the time off because we all work too hard. It's good to have that breath. And if having a holiday to celebrate this great man gives you a day off, great. But don't stay there. Have deeper eyes. Through the eyes of God, there's a lot more going on this weekend than perhaps a three-day work uh, weekend and a day off. On deeper inspection, it is a chance to look beyond our comfort to something that might be a little bit more uncomfortable. Now, I usually wander this stage a lot today. I want to stay close to home because I don't want to, to wander too far from what I believe is important to say today. Beneath the surface, there is something that must be rem remembered, recognized, addressed, and processed. Our lives, as we know them today, it's a product of a lot of things, yes? There are a lot of reasons that you have the blessed, amazing, wonderful life that you have today. Some of those things are completely and totally obvious. You've worked hard. You've worked really hard to get what you have. You have a degree of talents that you have worked hard to nurture those talents. We all sit here as the right person, in the right place, at the right time, making the right decisions, making the right choices, with the right opportunities that showed up. And that's very much on the surface. Those are human eyes. I want to look with God's eyes underneath to the place of understanding. One of the 12 powers of humanity is laid out by the Fillmore's understanding, the ability to look beneath the surface. Life is good, isn't it? Life is wonderful and life is magnificent. But when you take a look at underneath the surface, there are causes that are a little bit less obvious about why we have this blessed life. Using the eyes of God that is important to examine and spend some time beneath the surface to the things that are not readily apparent, but equally, if not more so, important to this magnificent life. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. knew this. He was a metaphysician when he said this statement right here. Let's put the slide up, please. Let's read this together. Everything that we see is a shadow cast by that which we do not see. He's speaking about a spiritual reality. We teach that every week from this platform. Underneath everything of a physical reality is a spiritual reality. This is just a shadow. The life that we have, the lives that we lead, are nothing more than shadows for a greater cause. Dr. King obviously knew the keen eyesight of God when making that statement. He certainly had the eyes of God when he stood for love in the face of hatred. That took the eyes and the heart and the ears and the spirit of something greater than a human being to do that. He certainly had the eyes of God when he stood for love and nonviolence in the face of heinous human atrocities. I want the same eyes. I want to, on Martin Luther King Jr., have those eyes and not just the ones that say, a day off. 
I want to look beyond the shadows of the life that I enjoy to that which cast the shadow. That is my life. That is everything I enjoy. I want to look beyond the effects of the life that I have to the causes that may have been overlooked or may have been forgotten. Breathe with me. My life is a shadow of giants. Like Martin Luther King Jr. that spoke about and demonstrated oneness long before I ever considered being a minister of oneness. He demonstrated oneness long before I ever had a notion that I belong to you, you belong to me, and we belong to each other in a great tapestry of creation. But make no mistake about it, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a shadow of giants who came before him. We must recognize those giants. Let's go back further in time and realize that he was actually an effect of men and women that came before him. Dr. King, his prominence, his, his message, his truth was a shadow of people who had endured unspeakable horrors at the hands of fear and at the hand of ignorance. The particular set of opportunities or encumbrances, blessings or sufferings that we all have, they are effects based upon the actions from centuries back of both very, very courageous people and very, very ignorant people. Spiritual, social, and political giants, as well as very scared, greedy, violent, and angry little people. We, every one of us, is a product of our ancestors, their expressions, their experiences. Some of us inherited a lot of benefits from those actions. Some of us reaped very unjust consequences that are still apparent today. The principles that Dr. King stood for, we've made a lot of progress, haven't we? We've come a long way, baby. You want to look at how far you have to go, take a moment to go, yeah, we've come a long way. So let's celebrate where we have been. Let's celebrate where we are going, but let us never lose sight of where we have come from because those who do not study history are bound to repeat it. And that history cannot and will not repeat it, be repeated in my life under my watch. If one uses the eyes of God to look beyond the shadows and the strength of God to summon the humility and the honesty Healing has a possibility of happening. Something good can emerge. And this today is not an energy born of guilt by any way, shape, or form. It is an energy that is born of truth. We are a teacher. We are teachers of truth. And truth must be in the field and look at it and something good can happen. On Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I want to remember the names of those who could easily be forgotten but upon whose shoulders the privileges that any one of us enjoys is founded on. The privileges, the life that I get to live is founded upon the shoulders and the shadows of giants where I have reaped the benefit. The privileges that any of us enjoy are founded on that. In preparation for today, I spent some time in Alabama last weekend. In particular, Birmingham and Montgomery. I visited the 16th Street Baptist Church to pay homage, where on September 15, 1963, Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, Carol Denise McNair lost their lives. I will not forget their names. I will not forget the shadow that is cast upon my life. My life and the privileges that I enjoy are partly due to their sacrifice and that of their ancestors. I want to be real clear. I don't know if I'm going to, I'm going to say it, the word white privilege. It does not make me a racist. White privilege does not make me a bad person. White privilege does not mean that I didn't work hard for the opportunities in my life. It doesn't mean that I don't have a degree of talents. It just simply means that I didn't have to suffer undue consequences, undue life experiences because of the color of my skin. That's all it means. That's all it means. I am not a hateful, angry, racist person. It just means that I had a foot up. Whenever White once said to me, you're asking us to run a race with you and you have a 20-mile head start. 
we will catch up. And that race can only be won as one in unity if I look back at where we have been I'm not forgetting the names, and I look forward to where we can be, and I'm a conduit to pay the shadow forward to the generations that are to come. I also visited when I went to Montgomery. You know, when I got a certain education about the civil rights movement, my education, I got a certain education growing up in the school system. It compared nothing to the education I got when I went to Montgomery, Alabama, which was the slave capital of our nation. There were people there at a fountain. I circled that fountain a number of times. It is a fountain where people were sold, families were destroyed, families were broken apart, human decency was cast aside in the name of the mighty dollar. Slave labor. Slave labor that built the White House that stands in our capital today. I will not forget. I made a vow each time I circled that fountain to never forget the names. Too many to remember. But I will not forget their sacrifice. Now let's be aware, we've come a long, long way. But we stand as the bridge between what has been and what will be and carry the legacy forward. Because if we don't pay attention to hope history and our future as the temple of courage and strength and vulnerability and humility and honesty, we are bound to repeat our history in one form or another. There are a few things that I learned as I circled those fountains. Number one, my great-grandparents and my grandparents were afforded opportunities based solely on the color of their skin. Not everybody's grandparents had those opportunities. My parents led a certain lifestyle of freedom, ease, and comfort based on what they inherited from my grandparents, based solely on the color of their skin. I enjoy a lot of privileges in my life, a lot of blessings in my life. I've worked hard for a lot of them, but the reality is based solely on the energetic inheritance of my grandparents and my parents, I had a leg up. An inheritance based solely on the color of my skin. None of my family has ever had to fear their freedom being taken away from them, either by slave traders, slave owners, biased legal systems, jail systems, or judicial systems. I am a product of the luxury of not having to deal with ridicule, injustice, retribution, beatings, and unfair practices based solely on the color of my family's skin. It doesn't make me a bad person. It doesn't make me a racist. It doesn't mean I haven't worked. It just means I haven't suffered undue pains simply because of the color of my skin. Now, to the best of my knowledge, this is a, what some people say when you have these kinds of dialogues that make it a little uncomfortable. To the best of my knowledge, nobody in my family has ever perpetrated an evil on anyone else based on their skin color, nor have I. My family worked hard and cultivated their talents to get what they have, just as every African-American person has done who rose above their less-than-ideal inheritance and less-than-humane history. But let me clearly say, to use that as my only answer to the privileges that I enjoy is an escape from the eyes of God. It's ignoring this view, not celebrating what took me from there to here, and not owning my responsibility to go from here to there to the mountain, to the mountain top. Thank you, Martin. Doing that cop-out, that great cop-out of not having the dialogue, certainly will assure that my grandchildren have the same opportunities that I have because my skin is a different color. 
but it also perpetuates the very system of inequality that I find abhorrent. And if you think we are removed from it, watch the news. Three men that look like me were recently arrested because they were planning a terrorist attack on the African-American community. That was just this week. Now again, I want to be really clear. This is not a story of sorrow. It is not a story of shame. I'm not telling this story to blame anybody. This is my thoughts about my life. And it might have something to awaken within you. I am grateful for the efforts and talents of those who overcame adversity, those who made the move from there to here. They should be recognized and celebrated. Celebrate it. At the same time, we should not and cannot separate ourselves from the past, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because it's uncomfortable. You see, the past, the present, the future, the family of humanity exists as one. Dr. King knew this. We teach that every Sunday. Here's what Dr. King had to say. Please read this with me. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny, whatever affects one directly affects indirectly. He clearly understood oneness. He clearly demonstrated oneness. We clearly talk about oneness. We are called to put our feet, our hands, our voice, our eyes, and our ears to oneness and to call it out every time we see it, and to call out when we don't see it. The shadows of great men and women, black, white, and every other color in between, we are the shadows of those people, whether we have been blessed with privilege or suffered undue consequences. We're in this together. We're figuring it out together. But we are also, let's never forget, that we are shadows of angry, fearful, and violent men and women as well. Past and present affect us all. I celebrate our progress and I honor it by continuing the courageous efforts to stay awake. As I walked through the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, I read thousands upon thousands of names who must not be dismissed, who must not be forgotten. Easily recognized names, like the man we celebrate, Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, less recognized names like John Lewis and Thurgood Marshall, but less recognized even than them, perhaps more easily forgotten, names like John Bailey. Anybody know who John Bailey was? I want to remember John Bailey today. John Bailey was lynched in 1900 right here in Cobb County. This church stands in a county where a lynching happened. I will not forget John's name, and I will carry his shadow forward. But let me continue. I will not forget the name Halls Riles, who was lynched in 1949, less than 100 years ago, in Decatur. I will not forget the name Porter Turner, murdered in 1945 in DeKalb County, or Mac Brown, and the other 35, 35 people lynched just up the street in Fulton County between 1889 and 1936. It brings it home, folks. It's in our backyard. And it's easy for me to say, I was in California. I was a Californian. It didn't affect me. It wasn't happening. Do you know as late as 1959 that there was a lynching because of somebody's skin color in California? I wasn't paying attention. And there was a lynching because of the, somebody's race as late as 1981. It's here. It's now. It's you. It's me. It's in the field. Not about shame, not about blame, just about recognition so that it never, ever happens again. This is something that was on the wall for, at the Memorial for Peace and Justice. And it's a little bit hard to read, but boy, is it real. 
and I stand on the shoulders of the people who suffered this. Let's next slide, please. Let's read it together. For the hanged and beaten, for the shot, drowned, and burned, for the tortured, tormented, and terrorized, for the abandoned by the rule of law, we will remember. I will remember their names. I will remember their sacrifice. And I will remember the fact that the life I get to lead today is because of that sacrifice. Does it make me a bad person? No. Does it make my life have a burning desire to stay more awake, to stay more conscious, and to not dismiss the privileges that I have to take them for granted, but to be ever mindful and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Mac Brown. Thank you, Rosa Parks. Thank you, Thurgood Marshall. Thank you, Halls Riles. Thank you, every other person who walks the face of the planet that is moving in the direction of oneness, moving in the direction of healing the past by not forgetting it, and moving in the direction of paying it forward to all the grandchildren, not just the ones with my face on them. Every grandchild. Now, I put some really heavy things out here today for consideration. Breathe with me. I want to clearly state that the legacy of these giants, whether they be victims or advocates of progress, cannot just be one of sorrow. Let today be a legacy of triumph as we look at how far we have come. But more importantly, let our fifth unity principle be lived. Let it be a legacy of action. Put my body in the way of racism. Put my mind, put my voice, put my heart, put my everything in the way of racism anywhere and everywhere that I see it, I call it out. And to have the courage and the strength to stand up. We must be a legacy not just of injustice, but of hope that lives in the proud voices that carry justice forward. It's easy once a year to Martin Luther King Jr., woo, okay, and then go back into day-to-day -day routine. I'm saying there can be no day-to-day -day routine. And I'm saying go to Montgomery, Alabama, and put your head right into the middle of what it was going on that we are not that far removed from. I want to be one of those voices. I want to be the giant that my grandchildren are saying 40, 50, 100 years from now, he had the guts and the courage to shift it around to make the world a better place. He had the guts to make sure that everybody had the same privileges that he had. He had the guts to stand up against injustice and racism wherever it may be, even when it was difficult in Cobb County. I want to be the voice that gives credence to the progress we have made, action to the love, the peace, the nonviolence, and equality, and to call out racism where I find it. Jesus, our master teacher, who we study every week, he gets, he gets top billing here at Unity North. This is what he had to say. I want you to read this with me. Next slide, please. Together. Whatsoever you do to the least of these, you do to me. I like to take Jesus' words and make them my own so that I can live them and integrate them into my life. Basically, what he's saying here is there are no throwaway people. Plain and simple. Nobody less than. And we sat here first service today, and I don't know if you all know Marie Reynolds. Marie Reynolds has a, a, a mentally challenged son with autism. He doesn't express like the rest of us. But see, as I look back here at where we have come as far as race goes, we have a long way to go when I see people walk away from Lake because he's different. Because he can't communicate the way I communicate. Because he sees the world differently than I see the world. I called a few of my very conservative friends and a few of my very liberal friends. I'm the guy in the middle here. And I said, here's what I want to share on Sunday morning. And I don't know how to do this without offending somebody. If you are offended, I'm asking you to look at this. What is the offense waking up in you? Because all I've done is share my thoughts. I am not taking a stand for Unity North except for peace, for love, and for justice.
There is no human being less valuable than any other, and that includes Republican and Democrat and Independent and Atheist and Christian. Nobody is a throwaway person, no matter how subtle or blatant their acts may be. To think otherwise is an antiquated, ignorant, and unacceptable view. It's human eyes, and I'm saying we need to have the eyes of God to say, thank God we don't do that anymore, and thank God we won't do this anymore, because thank God we're going someplace. I must have the eyes, the ears, and the voice of God that never lets the giants that whose shoulders I stand upon, be forgotten. The privileges that I enjoy demand it. The privileges as a good, loving person <laughs> demand it. We're going to go into a time of meditation. Let, you have, let yourself have the eyes, the eyes of understanding, seeing beneath the surface, seeing beneath the disagreements, seeing the difference of, of race and nationality and belief system. Your Christ, the Christ of your being will emerge, but the understanding must be a part of the equation. And so breathe with me. What's the song we're going to sing? There is no you, there is no me. A great composer wrote this song. <laughs> there is no you and me. <clears throat> and I need to confront any part of me, any part of me that exists back there. There is only us as one. And I invite you to look at this world as we know it today and to carry the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and say there is no us and them. Us and them is a house divided against itself that will fall. And us versus them will not exist in this congregation either. We disagree on a lot of things. And I say some things that really tick you off, but let's get make no mistake about it. There is no you and me, us and them. There is only one. And when we live as one, kindness has its way. When we live as one, compassion is realized. And when we live as one, we have the eyes of God. I'm going to ask for the lyrics up, so I'm going to ask to have you guys join us if you want. Once the lyrics are up. I'll give you the words. There is no you. There is no you. There is no me. There is no me. There's only God. There's only God. That I can see. That I can see. There is no you. There is no me. There's only God. There's only God. That I can see. There is no us. If you haven't done so, I invite you to close your eyes and allow yourself to relax. Just let go of everything that was, every thought that entered your mind, and allow the space of spirit to embrace you. Allow the love that cast the universe in motion to cradle you. Allow the tentacles that joins us one to the other to touch you in a place so deep you're warmed, you're nurtured, 
you are loved. And the deep knowing that each and every one of us is so loved that we were sent to this world as the only begotten child of love. No matter where you came from physically, no matter where you think you're going physically, you are the offspring, the nurtured and cherished offspring of love. This love asks of you a demonstration. This love asks of you a showing of its intent and its desire. Allow that knowing to settle deep into your heart that you are the manifestation of love. Allow the grace flowing from that love to form and inform your every action from this moment on. Allow this love to be reflected to you from everyone you meet. Allow this love to show you its image and its likeness in every, every living thing, that they too are this love, this vast and all-encompassing love wishes to demonstrate its being as you. This love wishes